Thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm Alessandro, and I've been for uh, more than 10 years the maintainer of the Turbo Gears 2 open source web framework. I'm the author of DuckPy, which is a JavaScript interpreter for Python. Uh, I'm the author of Depot, which is a framework to manage uh, file storage in web application. And more recently, I've been a contributor to the Apache Arrow project. Um, currently, I work as the director of engineering at Volton Labs, uh, or better, Volton Data Labs, uh, and the, I'm the author of the Modern Standard Library Cookbook and the Crafting Test and Software with Python books. Today, I'm here because I wanted to talk to you about Apache Arrow. Apache Arrow is an incredibly interesting project that is trying to shape the future of data analytics. Uh, Apache Arrow is a data interchange standard, so you can just go and read the paper that describes the format and use it in any application where you want to have a way to eff efficiently and quickly store data in memory or on disk. It's, uh, that format can be used to keep data in memory or send it through the network or keep it saved on your disk or any storage that you have. But Apache Arrow is not just a format, it's also an implementation of that format, providing an I.O. library to read various data files into uh, the in-memory format of Arrow. It provides a vector computation library to run operations over the data that you have stored in the Apache Arrow format. It, it gives you a data frame-like library. It gives you a query engine, which is named Acero inside the Apache Arrow project. It gives you a way to manage your partition of data if you have a data set spread across multiple files on maybe network file system or even locally. And uh, uh, it does all that by giving you the chance to use whatever language or technology you want. So if you see the schema that is available here, the end goal of Apache Arrow is to allow you to write your code in any language you prefer. You're a Java user, a Python user, or C++ user, doesn't matter. You always work with the Arrow library implemented for that language and environment. And uh, the Arrow library will work with the in-memory format that is uh, specified by the Arrow specifications. And by using that in-memory format, you will have access to uh, the various uh, storage or network services that speak the same format. So the idea is to make a lingua franca, I would say, that every data analytics software can share so that they can speak each other without occurring in additional cost of translation. For this reason, given that it tries to implement a lot of very different features and capabilities, the Apache Arrow project is actually used and it can be uh, scary on the first time you approach it because there are so many things inside that for new users uh, it's frequently hard to understand where to start to from and what's the purpose of the Apache Arrow library itself. And um, the, the end goal of the project is probably to allow you to write your code anywhere on your laptop uh, or uh, like on your tablet, doesn't matter. Deploy it on everything you want, like run it on your own PC, run it on, the, on a distributed production environment. And as they all speak Arrow, your code won't have to be changed and will just work flawlessly across all those environments. And we are here specifically to talk about PyArrow which is the implementation of Arrow for the Python uh, ecosystem. And it provides, like I would say, 90% uh, of what's available in Arrow itself. So PyArrow is a fairly complete implementation of Arrow. It's probably one of the, of the most complete implementation of PyArrow. And for that reason, you can freely uh, use it and be uh, comfortable that anything that is documented in Arrow will be available in PyArrow too. 
Originally, as I was mentioning, Arrow was born as a columnar data format. So obviously the fundamental entity in Arrow is a column of data, which is exposed by the array class usually in most bindings. And specifically for PyArrow, it's the PyArrow array object. If you ever use NumPy, which I guess you probably had, uh, PyArrow at this level is not much different from a single dimension NumPy array. Uh, actually, as we will see, it's possible to convert a PyArrow array to a, a NumPy array and vice versa without occurring any additional cost of conversion. So to give you some uh, idea of what might be different from uh, PyArrow arrays to NumPy arrays, uh, they are uh, very similar from the point of view of usage, but they are very different from the point of view of uh, internals and capabilities. For example, why obviously in both NumPy and PyArrow I'm able to just create an array of integers. Uh, in the case of PyArrow, I can actually start complex data structures inside my array. So for example, in that case where I'm storing two dictionaries inside the array, I'm not going to save, I'm not going to have references to the Python objects inside the array, but I'm going to have the actual data inside the array itself, so that when I access any uh, entry in the array, I don't have to occur in the cost of looking up the Python object and working at Python level. Uh, but I'm uh, going to directly assess the raw data inside the PyArrow array without occurring any additional overhead that Python might introduce. Also, the PyArrow arrays are masked, masked natively, so you don't have to keep a, a separate uh, mask and, uh, and array uh, entity. Uh, while in NumPy, for example, usually people use masked arrays, which in practice are two arrays joined together, one for the mask and one for the uh, data itself. And also the way that, uh, that PyArrow deals with strings is much more effective than the way that NumPy deals with strings. Because in the case of NumPy, strings are still Python objects. So every entry in your array will be a reference to a Python object. And if you need to assess it or run any computation over it, you won't be able to leverage any particular performance improvement that your CPU might provide because you will have to work at the Python level. Instead, PyArrow arrays are much more uh, optimized for in-memory storage and for CPU or GPU computation, especially vectorized computation. So uh, in the case of a standard array, like in this case, you can see the memory format of a PyArrow array that contains unsigned integers. Uh, what gets stored by PyArrow is a buffer with all the data, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on and a validity bitmap with the, uh, with the mask that tells if those values are null or not. So uh, you are not forced to use only none as a null value. You can have any value that might be representing missing data because there might be, if you think about something like a survey, there might be many different reasons why a data is missing. It might be because the person never answered that, uh, that question, or it might be, for example, because he didn't want to answer that question. So those might be two different values, but both of them will still count as null values. And as I was mentioning, the in-memory format for strings is far more optimized compared to the one that NumPy uses, uh, so that the uh, the main difference is probably that PyArrow keeps a single continuous buffer for strings. So if you need to do any lookup or uh, transform the data or run any operation on all the entries in the array, you don't have to jump across multiple different Python objects resolving references, but you can just scan through the array and perform the computation that you wanted, also leveraging uh, 
vectorized optimization uh, SM, SM ID and things like that. Obviously, in Pyaro, we are not just restricted to representing data. As I mentioned before, there is a component in Pyaro which is named Acero, which is a query and computation engine that provides kernels for multiple functions that allow you to perform transformations, lookups, uh, or various kinds of operation that you might be used to have. Uh, on top of the uh, arrow objects. So in this case, for example, I could take a pi arrow array, just made of numbers because it was the most simple one to represent, and I might just multiply all the entries uh, in the array by two. Um, in the future, we are thinking of introducing a syntax similar to the one in NumPy, so using the uh, multiply operator instead of explicitly calling the uh, the computation function that Acero provides. But for the moment, those operations are available to an explicit function call. So in this case, uh, pyaro compute dot multiply. Uh, if you notice, in most cases, unless you uh, explicitly ask for it, the the data in the um, in the PyRO array is not just directly available as a list, but it's an object that has its own internal representation. This is because underlying PyRO is implemented in fully native code base. So we are not dealing with list or Python objects. And uh, so the, the standard way you get printed uh, entities is without their content, but obviously you can always ask for their content by calling the toString method at any time. Uh, for example, I might want to just count the frequency of the values in the array, and that would be another compute operation provided by Acero, or might be wanting, wanting to know the minimum and maximum value inside an array or anything like that. So uh, if you are interested in all the features that the Acero Compute Engine can provide, you can find them listed in the documentation under the Compute uh, page. Obviously, I told you that uh, Arrow was born as a columnar format, and that implies that if I have a column, I have a table where I can put those columns. So uh, PyArrow also provides the table uh, object, which is a bit more like a pandas data frame, I would say, or <laughs> even to the comparison, it's very different because uh, tables are uh, both more lightweight and uh, uh, don't provide the same rich set of capabilities out of the box. Uh, but they are optimized for storing data, so like uh, columns are uh, stored in a referenced way. So if you want to remove or add the column, there is no cost on changing the data. You can append columns without any cost, and you can append rows without any cost of copying the data because the data is stored in chunk array. So if you want to append additional rows to a table, you just append more chunks to the chunked array and the existing rows don't have to be reallocated, touched or modified at all, which is much more performant compared to what Pandas does uh, that usually is storing a big array, big NumPy arrays, multidimensional NumPy arrays for the various columns and things like that. So that if I have to extend the data in those arrays, it usually involves a copy of all the data into a bigger memory pool. Arrays provide many of the, uh, sorry, tables provide many of the operation you would expect to be able to perform on them. Like for example, you can obviously take any row that you want. You can uh, uh, access the, the columns that you want. You can add or remove columns. And uh, in practice rows, are, uh, in practice tables are just a set of pi r arrays paired with a schema. So if you look at the table.schema, 
you will have names for the columns, obviously, and the type for each column. Knowing the type beforehand is what allows uh, Arrow to store those data in a perfectly optimized format for that specific type. So, uh, for example, if I use a array of uh, integer uh, or an array of bytes, they are uh, represented in memory in different ways so that uh, it's faster to perform a computation operation on any of them. And uh, you can freely easily create PyArrow tables from uh, Python objects or Pandas objects or whatever it's convenient for you just by passing them to the table factory. Like in this case, I created them to a list of arrays paired with names, but I could even use a dictionary where the key is the name of the column and the values are the arrays. And through the SRO uh, compute engine, we could have access to most common transformation analytics functions like joining, filtering, or aggregating the data in tables. So for example, here you can see some very simple uh, analytics uh, capabilities that I'm getting from Acero and applying to tables. As usually the PyArro compute module is what will get you access to the Acero compute engine and I might have a table where I want to filter the data so look up for all the values that are equal for or I could come up with a filter of any complexity I want. I could perform an aggregation on top of the data, so uh, get me the sum of all the values grouped by the keys, or I can pick two tables and join them uh, by using a left join and see and get back a new table with the data of all of both the tables that I join. The interesting feature of PyArrow, I think that is, is that if you are already using Pandas or NumPy in your production environment, you don't have to start by replacing everything with Arrow. Uh, the uh, PyArrow library provides a zero copy, no marshalling or marshalling cost capability of transforming uh, data from the supported uh, sources into the arrow format and vice versa. So for example, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the schema that I uh, placed on the slide, you will see that one of the supported formats is pandas. And that means that I can use the two pandas feature of arrays and tables to get back a pandas object from them. Uh, so in practice, the way that Arrow is trying to go is that instead of having copy and convert operations for each one of the formats that are out there, for each one of the frameworks and libraries that are available in data science, uh, it provides support for native representation of Arrow in uh, uh, of Arrow format in all those libraries and allows you to get data in and out of all those libraries, frameworks, and storages without ever occurring any cost of transformation or conversion or marshalling the data or something like that. It's not always possible. So there might be cases where you have to occur in a conversion cost, but Arrow will be explicit when that happens. So it, by default, it will try to do a zero copy conversion. And if the conversion requires a copy, it will give you an error and it will ask you to explicitly set a value to say, yes, you can copy the data so that it doesn't happen by chance and you suddenly discover six months later in production that you had a performance bottleneck you weren't even aware of. And uh, it's fast. It's very fast compared to what you might be used to, to leverage every day. Uh, for example, here you can find a, a simple case where I create an array of numbers from 0 to 5, and I then store that array, that Python list actually, into a NumPy array and into a PyArrow array. 
So same exact data created from the same exact original Python object. In one case, I'm going to count all the single values, all the unique values in the array, and get back which are the values and which, are, uh, which one is the frequency for these values using NumPy. And that took uh, one and a half second. And in the second case, I'm doing the same exact operation. So give me back the values and the frequency of the values, but using PyArrow. And in that case, it only took 0 0.37 uh, seconds. So you can see that the order of magnitude is important and the performance improvement by using PyArrow can be significant. And it can be significant not only if you use PyArrow directly, but even if you are pairing it with something else like Pandas. So for example, if I create a data frame, so a Pandas data frame from a big Python object, it might take, uh, in, in this example, 80, 82 milliseconds. Uh, but if I do the, the same by creating a PyArrow table, and then converting that table to a data frame, it's actually faster. So even if uh, PyArrow had to perform two operations in this case, it ended up being faster than Pandas itself. So for example, one use case for PyArrow might be to read the data. Suppose you are facing a format that Pandas does not yet support and Arrow does. You might use PyArrow to read the data into a PyArrow table and then convert that table to Pandas. It would be a perfectly effective and well-performing solution to your problem that allows you to slowly introduce PyArrow in your code base without having to replace everything that you are using at the moment. That's possible thanks to the fact that you can always convert back and forth with Pandas and NumPy without occurring performance cost in doing this conversion. So for example, suppose that I want to read a CSV file, a fairly big one, and I use the, uh, you see the pandas as an engine option. And one possibility is to use the default one, so the one that pandas provides internally. And in that case, reading that CSV file took 13 seconds. So it's a fairly big amount of time, something you will see, <laughs> you will have to wait for it. But if you specify to Pandas to use PyArrow as the engine to read the data, it will actually only take 2.7 seconds. So it will be far faster. And you see that this is an example of what Arrow is trying to do. So make it in something that is natively supported in frameworks out there. So for example, Pandas is able to leverage PyArrow for storing strings because it's better, uh, it's more effective and faster than the native format that, Py, that Pandas uses. It's able to leverage PyArrow to load data because it's faster than the standard implementation that Pandas provides. And uh, uh, we have supporting GeoPandas if you need to use uh, ge geographic data and all those kind of things. The, the ecosystem of frameworks, libraries, and tools that support Arrow is constantly growing every day. And the PyArrow project has proved to be a successful one. If you look at the history of downloads over the course of time, it's becoming a clear, uh, a clear player in the data science and data analytics world. Actually, some of the uh, libraries or tools that you use every day might be using Arrow inside and you might not even know because they just rely on it to perform whatever operations they need. Uh, okay, going further, uh, let me introduce you one very cool feature that PyArrow provides. We all know that everything is fine, great, and simple, and goes straightforward as far as you are working with a CSV file on your laptop. But what happens when you need to work with real world data, which is big, it's scattered across multiple files, it's on a network file system somewhere out in the cloud, or those kind of things. Usually there are things get much more complex because you suddenly have to work with something that orchestrates your data. You suddenly have to work with a different set of APIs. 
because you cannot really create a, a plain NumPy array out of a file on S3 or something like that. You will have to manually do all the operations that are necessary to, to make it happen. While PyArrow does that step forward, that additional step, and, allow, and gives you the dataset API. The dataset API is an abstraction that works on top of all the other abstractions. So in practice, on top of tables in this case, and that represents you as a single big table. Well, it doesn't really use a table because it uses a dataset class, but you can imagine it as a single huge table made of all the data that you had scattered across all the files on all the uh, file system where you are storing them. And obviously it provides lazy access to that data. So you don't have to load uh, 40 gigabytes of data in memory before you can start working with it. And it allows and it provides native support for the SRO compute engine. So most of the operation you were able to run on a table, you will be able to run on a data set. So for example, you can join data sets if you're looking for even more bigger data and uh, you can use uh, filter the data sets, you can project the data sets, you can in practice do any operation you would expect to be able on top of a standard uh, table of data. So uh, for example, this is a schema that uh, should allow you to get uh, to easily understand what the data set API is about. In practice, you might have the, your data stored in multiple uh, in different file formats. It might be in Parquet, it might be in CSV, it might be in JSON, it might be on ORC, it might be on uh, Feather, it might be on any format that Arrow supports, and it can, will be saved on your local file system or on Azure, on S3, or HDFS, or any file system that Arrow supports. And that wouldn't matter. You just create a data set, you point it to the location for your data and your data will be available to you. Uh, you don't even have to care too much about how to load it, which files are uh, available and how they are partitioned or any information like that. And then you will be able to use your data set to run operation to the query engine or the data frame like API that data set provides. For example, here I'm getting the, uh, how to say, the pickup and dropouts of taxi uh, trips in New York City from the S3 file system. And that data is partitioned by year and month because it's a huge data. You can imagine that during a single day there are uh, tons of uh, taxi trips on New York City. So even storing a single day of data, it's already a pretty big uh, CSV file. And by partitioning them into year and month, I can store many smaller files on the file system. And all I have to do is just take my data set and point it to the location where the data is available, in this case, the S3 bucket and tell it how that data is partitioned. So tell it that the uh, starting partition key is the year and the second partition key is the month. And then that's it. That's all I needed to, to have my data available for me to work with. Uh, so if, for example, I ask the count of all the entries that are available there, I get back a count that includes the data from all the files, not just like the first or one of them all the entries stored in all the files that I partitioned. And uh, in this case, I had the data partitioned across more than a hundred different files. And I could pick to the data by looking at the first five entries of it and so on. So it's not much different from a plain normal table with the difference that you are working with hundreds of files stored on a remote file system. So uh, we saw how Arrow provides capabilities for performing analytics by using arrays, by using tables, and by using datasets, and how the ASRO compute engine uh, allows you to run operation on those entries. But there is much more in the Arrow ecosystem. Uh, 
uh, you, you have many tools ready that support Aro natively that will allow you to create very complex web application with minimal effort. Uh, like, for example, we have Haro Flight, which is a protocol for exchanging data on network distributed systems. So the, if the client and server both talk flight, they could pass the data around without occurring in any marshalling and non-marshalling cost, which will make your data transfer very fast compared to what it's usually the standard uh, time. You can use the uh, Arrow to read many different formats. New formats are added and supported by Arrow every month. So it's a constantly growing library of uh, readers and writers for the most commonly used formats in data science. You can leverage ADBC, which is a new piece that was added to the Arrow ecosystem that allows you to directly query database, uh, database management systems. Uh, without occurring any marshalling and non-marshalling cost, or even without occurring the cost of advancing cursors when you read the data. So it's a much more optimized protocol compared to ODBC. And it, in practice, if you embrace Arrow, you have access to a whole ecosystem of library tools, frameworks, and even hardware that speaks Arrow. This is a quick example. Uh, th those are the most uh, common things that came to my mind that currently natively support Arrow. You can uh, get Arrow data out of Parquet files, out of Cassandra database, out of HBase, out of Spark. Spark is able to use Arrow to exchange data across the nodes and to use Arrow to store the data on your, uh, on your storage. You can use Impala, you can use DuckDB to query the data uh, by relying on Arrow, or you can use IBIS, which we had, we had a talk on IBIS, I think, yesterday morning. It's a great project. You should look at it if you don't already know it. And IBIS natively supports Arrow and the Arrow H A0 compute engine. So that's it. I tried to give you a overall uh, idea of what Arrow is about and what it can do for you, especially the Py Arrow library, which is the Python access to the Arrow world. But if you want to know more, you can go and have a look at the documentation, especially the getting started section, which will give you a quick introduction to Py Arrow. And you can look at the Py Arrow cookbook, which is a fairly complete set of examples that you can just copy and paste in your code to do the operations that you are looking for. If you have any questions, uh, I think we have 10 more minutes available for them, and I'm here. Well, that was a great talk, and if anyone has questions, uh, please come up to the mic here and go ahead. Hi, Alessandro, uh, great talk. Um, I'm a contributor to Pullers, which is an Arrow-based uh, data frame library. Mm -hmm. And one of the really common questions we get is, historically, you've had the same in memory representation for both your data frame and scikit-learn, your basic machine learning library. Mm -hmm. And now you've got Arrow for your data frame library. Do you expect that machine learning libraries will also move to Arrow? Or do you think that having just something like a NumPy array will be the best um, going forward for those libraries? That's an interesting question. There is some, some work on uh, supporting Arrow in uh, machine learning libraries at the moment. For example, I know that, we, that there is around uh, Py, PyTorch Arrow that it's, it's, doing, it's working on that. I think it's a, it's, there is not a single answer. It's not something like a project that is moved by a single entity. It's a joint effort across many different open source maintainers and companies and things like that. So it's really more a matter of getting together into a, the mailing list or anything like that, make a proposal and discuss it with, with everyone else. So it's very hard for me to predict the future. I would say it makes sense if we are able to speak the same language. But there might be reasons I'm not aware of because I'm not a machine learning expert that makes harder for, for machine learning libraries to leverage Arrow. 
and uh, and in that case probably what i would like to see is for people to raise those problems so that we can extend the arrow format for example recently uh, it came to our attention that arrow is missing some data types that are uh, available in in velox which is a open source project uh, built by meta and uh, what we are probably going to do is just extend the standard, the ARO standard, the ARO specification by adding support for those types so that people and Meta can start leveraging ARO for, for Velox. Yeah, briefly, the best kind of response I've heard is that your machine learning libraries are really about doing linear algebra, and that might, that's a different kind of use case in data frames. You might just see this kind of Two, two kind of representations needed to have the best for both worlds. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, kind of a <clears throat> similar related question. What are the kind of roadblocks for uh, teams that you've seen uh, moving over to Pyro? Um, if they're you know using Spark nowadays or if they're using Pandas, are there anything that people are kind of commonly um, coming across? Uh, that's an interesting question. I think that first of all, you, there is you are not forced to, to move to PyArrow in the sense that many, many libraries and frameworks are moving to PyArrow themselves to, so that you don't have to do that work. Uh, but if you want to start leveraging PyArrow directly and benefit from its performance and capabilities, I think I would personally start with uh, some specific uh, functions or features where you see that PyArrow is immediately providing values. Uh, so in those cases, you might be able to just convert the data from, from PyArrow into your system and might be able to do that without occurring the conversion cost. And so your code could freely leverage both, both uh, libraries and both systems. Uh, maybe you have Pandas as your overall uh, library, but there are some computations that you implement in Arrow because they are faster. And that's something perfectly doable, and I think it's a wise uh, step forward in the direction of slowly rolling out Arrow into a pr existing project. Cool. Yeah, sounds exciting. Looking forward to playing with this. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, I love uh, Pi Arrow, oh, and uh, I use it with uh, PySpark, and then they have this Pandas UDF that uh, yeah. interoperates. Uh, but is it a, mi a missed opportunity to expose it directly as pandas? Because in essence, it's a PyArrow uh, backend that they use. Um, actually, another question is whether, uh, in that sense, PyArrow has the goal to also have this. Uh, I mean, you have this compute engine. Do you have this idea of, like pandas have, uh, like a layer on top of your data representation, like apply, uh, use a defined function, that kind of. Uh, abstraction that we now exploit in those uh, pandas UDFs to project our, our Python functionality on top, yeah. on the rows, let's say. Yeah. That's, that's actually a great question. It's something that I forgot to mention in the, in the presentation. Uh, Arrow actually has support for user-defined functions. And uh, they, are, they are not, uh, I would say, there are still a lot of uh, a long way to go in terms of uh, being what we uh, are looking for. But at the moment, if you are concerned about using them as you would use pandas, so uh, implement a Python function and invoke it from the SFO compute engine, that's something that is already doable. It's, uh, it's not as immediately straightforward as you would with uh, pandas where you just invoke apply and pass the function. In the case of Arrow, you have actually to register the function mm. with a name, with a signature, and then the callable that actually would implement the function. But it's, I mean, it's still one line of code, just three arguments <laughs> instead of one. Yeah, and but it might change the way you represent those figures because now we really show it as a sort of interoperability yeah. library, while it might actually be that's a unified computer layer. Great, right. no, that's where I was uh, going to in the sense that the reason why I say that they are not yet at the state where we would like them to be is that there is a lot of work that we still have to do to make possible to uh, ship user-defined functions around. 
So for example, suppose that you on your machine implemented the user defined functions, but you are going to run the query on a cluster or an ASEO or cluster out there. The ASEO cluster will need to have a way to get your function implementation into the cluster and run. And that's something that at the moment we are not yet ready for, but it's something where, which we are working for and specifically we are working close contact with the Substrate uh, specification and project. Substrate, if you don't know about it, it's in practice something similar to what Arrow does for data representation, Substrate tries to do for query representation. So something like a uh, standardization of SQL that it's not human readable, it's byte based, so it's something for exchanging queries across computation nodes, but it uh, it's, tries to become the, the standard de facto for exchanging queries between client servers, servers and servers and things like that. And we are trying to work on having a way to exchange user defined functions as part of the query that invokes them. Thanks. Hi, great talk. Um, it seems like it's um, really cool, but my question will be, when shouldn't I use Pyro and still use Pandas? Uh, my answer would probably be when you face a bottleneck. Like the main reason where people approach to Pyro is because they need uh, they they find that pandas is might be too slow for what they are trying to do, and uh, and maybe optimizing pandas to become faster will require an effort that they don't want to invest because it might be days, weeks, or even more of maybe rewriting that computation directly in Cyton or even C. And uh, by using PyArrow, you might be able to just replace one or two or, I don't know, three, four, five or whatever lines of code with the equivalents in PyArrow and get the same exact result five or ten times faster. And uh, that, that might be a reason why you slowly start introducing PyArrow in an existing project, for example. Okay, thank you. Three more minutes, so I think you both wanted to one small question if anyone wants, or we can just include this right now and oh, okay. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, oops, sorry. Uh, thanks, great talk. Uh, so you've said lots of nice things about Pyro. Are there any like uh, you know blockers or reasons why I don't want to use Py Arrow? Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Am I forced to answer? <laughs> no, just joking. Yes, obviously, like with any library or framework out there, it's not just uh, happy things and so on. For example, one of the things where we are investing a lot of time recently is improving PyR documentation because it's a project that grows very quickly with a lot of developers throwing features and capabilities into it and the documentation has been a bit behind from the point of view of being easy to consume and read. So for example, the reference is very complete and for many functions you have examples and things like that. But if you are trying to start using a new feature that you don't know, uh, there might be a lack of tutorials or introductions to that feature. And uh, I think that that's great. That's something that I really value is when users open issues about those problems. Because obviously for us as developers and constant users of Pyaro, everything is obvious <laughs> because we, we wrote it. But for external users, it might be not as simple and uh, they could help us understand where there is space for improvement. All right, let's give a warm round of applause to Alexander. Thank you.